thank you for joining me on another episode of She Leads Now podcast, where we help career and entrepreneurial women gain the tools to develop a success mindset, create winning strategies, build collaborative relationships, and take bold action towards creating impact and fulfillment in their lives and careers. I'm your host, Sabine Gideon, and I'm on a mission to awaken and activate women and emerging leaders so they can tap into their innate leadership ability, elevate their influence, and create the impact they were destined to make. If you're ready to up-level your confidence, courage, and influence, you've come to the right place. Join me weekly for insights, strategies, and resources to help you grow, develop, and embody the leader you were meant to be so that you can make the impact you know you are called to make and establish the legacy you've always dreamed. The world eagerly awaits the emergence of your brilliance, impact, and influence. So with that, let's dive into this week's episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of She Leads Now. I'm your host, Sabine Gideon, and we are back for another episode of the Lead Hership Reloaded series, Reimagining, Redefining, and Rehumanizing Leadership. And so today I have another powerhouse with me who I have been admiring from afar on LinkedIn. We have Deb Crow with us. So Deb is an executive and business coach. She has 32 years of global experience in top Fortune 500 companies in Canada, the United States, Europe, Asia, and Australia, leading and coaching C-suite leaders, executive professionals, teams, and businesses into success. Deborah's expertise includes leadership development, change management, human resources, human resources onboarding, diversity and inclusion practices, and assessing and integrating high-performance teamwork. With that, welcome to the show, Deb. So excited to have you here. I, I'm honored to be here. It's it's nice to be on the other side of the mic. <laughs> I'm sure it, it, it's the easy part, right? To just absolutely. Just, yeah. I love it. I love it. So you have been a a entrepreneur for the last 32 years. You've been in this space, you know, for a significant amount of time, making impact and making change. And you know, we were talking about this before. What I love is your focus on heart-centered leadership. So before you got to this space, I'd be curious if you just walk us through briefly your journey, the decisions that you made, and what has led you to this philosophy and this way of being when it comes to heart-centered leadership. Sure, I'd love to. So my my journey took a few detours like many people. I had to drop out of school at 21 because I lost my dad and didn't really have any parental or financial support. So I had to go back to work. So I think that was really the start of my formidable years because formidable years, a lot of people attribute that to teenage years. And I was more of a caregiver than a teenager. I had a lot of responsibility on my shoulders, but didn't really reflect on it till after my dad had passed away. So I went to work and I decided to work for a temp agency so that I could collect and gather experience from different sectors to make my resume a little bit more inviting. So I did that for three years and I saw every negative part of the wrong type of leadership. And it was almost like a nudge. And I was at a technical company. I loved my job. And the president used to call just to hear me answer the phone because he used to say, I love that. It doesn't matter when I call. You always answer the phone the same way. You're friendly, you're approachable, you're gregarious. And to me, I always felt like the words like and love and heart had a place in leadership language. And it was a wake-up call for me when I was told and laughed at that it didn't. It's not part of business acumen. It's not in our leadership playbook. And I thought, but it's all I know. It's how I was raised. I had an Irish Nana who used to say to me, when you're kind, everything will come back to you tenfold. So I chose to stay in my lane. So long story short, one of the VPs asked me out for lunch and I was 23 And I was a little bit leery to go, and I'll be completely transparent. I thought he was going to hit on me because that had happened at a previous employer, and and I was a young single girl. But I went, and that lunch changed my life. He leaned over the table, and he said, I'm going to say something to you, and I really need you to listen. 
And he said, you're losing your job at five o'clock because you have a boss who doesn't see your greatness, nor does she know how to foster it. And he said, you need to go start your own business. So you can only imagine at 23, how I was feeling. It's not like I had my dad. I I didn't have anyone to talk to. And I remember going out to my car at 5.05 and just crying and thinking, okay, like, what am I supposed to learn here? And I started my company May 30th of 1990. I'm celebrating 33 years in May. And I think, you know, as I look back at every decade, every barrier, every pivot, every U-turn, every no, every negative piece of information, it got me to where I am, but I never let go of being heart-centered. And here we are now in a world that's attempting to embrace post-COVID and what's everybody doing? everybody's jumped on the bandwagon. It's it's where we need to be. It's where we should be. Not from an obligation standpoint, but boy, did it take us a long time to get here. Agreed. Oh my goodness. I I love having these conversations because I, I love hearing everyone's journey, right? Especially, you know, in, in the society that we live in, like we catch people when they're on their mountains, right? And have no idea the the valleys and the twists and the turns and it took for them to get there. And, you know, while I do believe that success leaves clues, there's no one pathway. And so I I love the fact that, you know, through your journey and and even just that VP seeing in you what he saw in you, not just to give you the heads up, but to reaffirm to you in that moment that it was your greatness and not your shortcomings or not anything else that, you know, was creating the situation. I, I just, I just think that that's amazing. Curious, do you guys still stay in touch? You know, I always get a bit teary eyed. I just lost him four years ago to stomach cancer. And it's interesting because we became really good friends and he was old enough to be my dad. So was he really filled a void in my life as a father figure And it was very serendipitous because the last conversation I had with him almost brought me back to that 21 year old girl when I had the last conversation with my own dad. And he said to me, please keep working with people and please don't ever not be yourself because what you bring is is just a, a beauty of authenticity and transparency and I'm just myself and not just, I am myself. And sometimes I think when you have a bright light, because I've done a lot of work in spirituality and I became a yoga teacher at 50. And I think sometimes when your light is bright and it's really embraced with positivity and, and not seeing barriers, not everybody aligns with that. And that's okay because they haven't got to the length in their journey that I have. And this is how I try and frame things, especially when people are not good listeners or they're not understanding someone else. And we just have to keep things simple. Oh my gosh, I love it. And and so sorry for your loss on on both fronts. You know, you mentioned the bright light and I don't know, well, I do know why, but it's been for the last several weeks, Miriam Williamson's quote, Our Deepest Fear, or the poem, Our Deepest Fear. And the the part of it that talks about that it's not our it's it's not the darkness that we're afraid of, but that it's our own light. And when we shine our own light, we you know unconsciously give others permission to do the same. And so that's what came up as you were talking. And so I, I love the fact that you you knew that at such a young age. And so many of us, at least for me, you know, it's a, a rock bottom experience for me to even go on a pathway to start searching for that light. But I I love the fact that it was instilled in you and you've held on to that. And it's just a part of who you are and your being. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes that's all we have to hold on to. And that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. So in the context of leadership in this day and age, and I totally agree with you. I, I remember coming into corporate where it was just, you know, leave your feelings at the door, your issues at the door. When you come here, you're this person. And I remember going through, you know, stages of my life where 
I was so compartmentalized, right? Like there was the spiritual Sabine, there was the corporate Sabine, there was the Sabine with her family and the Sabine with her friends. And, you know, just getting to this place at this stage in my life where I'm like, I'm one person. I've always been one person and I'm going to show up that way. But now we're seeing that, you know, leaders are being invited. And, and by leaders, I'm, I'm referencing everyone, right? Because I do believe that leadership is innate and we all have it. It shows up differently and we have our different spheres of influence. But even more and more these days, post COVID and, and post everything that has taken place in the U.S. and all over the world, you know, there is this invitation, this unspoken invitation to say, come back to who you really are. Come back to the truth and the essence of who you are, your identity, your your power, your strength, your glory, and all of those pieces. So I'm curious to hear from you, you know, how how is that resonating for those whom you work with and whom you serve, who want to, you know, be the, the individual who is on track when it comes to the budget and, you know, got the spreadsheets down and, you know, they're leading organizations and they're driving through change, but also understand that they can't be as effective if they can't connect with other people, if they can't get to the deep root of who they are. What has that experience been like the last three years for you? It's been very interesting given the trajectory of us all being home. And a lot of leaders have finally had time to stop and pause and breathe and give themselves more time to look at things, but how they feel about things. So, you know, there seems to be a lot of press on leaders. And I think really the problem from my vantage point is business acumen doesn't have the language to support heart-centered leadership. So all these amazing young adults coming out of an MBA or an executive MBA the language isn't there. And these are our future leaders. So there's room for soft skills. And what that means is the leaders need to lead from the inside out. This isn't about academic excellence, initials after your name. This is about fostering our inner world and understanding that our identity is not attached to our worth and worthiness. Nor is that fancy corner office, your fancy title. We need to stay heart-centered. And and my definition of heart-centered leadership is honoring your connection with people. So when you're leading an organization and you have that visceral feeling of cultural intelligence, it's always people first. So when the people are happy and functioning and heard and liked and valued and validated, there's no room for toxicity to creep in. And when a leader can lead from the inside out, that means that they're honoring themselves. They're honoring core competencies in a verbal expression of soft skills, being that empathetic leader, listening for the sake of listening, not to respond not to have a transaction, not to look for a transaction, and certainly not to open the bandwidth to allow any level of reciprocity. They weren't trained that way. That's not the leadership playbook. The leadership playbook needs to be thrown in the garbage because you look at Gary Vee, you look at a CEO like Mike Sievert from T-Mobile, they're changing the landscape, the lens, the languaging, And quite frankly, if a leader chooses not to go this route, this is why companies have so many open vacant spots and why they're literally suffering with employee retention. Agreed. Totally agree. And, you know, one of the things that I've found to be interesting is that as we as we look at current state, right, we can see that there is a model of leadership that is exiting, right, in in every area uh, of society. And then there's one that's coming in and and maybe it's already been here, but you have the the demographics of the the boomers, right? And how they they operated and command and control. Generation X kind of like fell in line with that to an extent. And then millennials were like, what is this? But I'll do it because 
I have no other choice. And, you know, this is what my parents are telling me that this is normal. And then you have Generation Z who is kind of like, I'm sorry, I, I don't want any parts to this. Right. And then you take a step back and, you know, now we have leaders in place who, because of what they've been taught, right? You think about schooling, our school system teaches us, you know, you, you're an achiever and it's individualistic. And even if you're on a sports team, right, there's competition. It's, it's not about, you know, other people. And so we, we grow up with these patterns and these beliefs and these ideas that are instilled in us around what it means to be a leader, what it means to be quote unquote successful. And then we get in corporate America and people are still demonstrating these behaviors. And for a while, they were getting rewarded for it. So it was being reinforced. And now in the last three years, it's like, you got to change who you are. And as you know, <laughs> change is hard. You know, change is hard for us individually. And then to support someone through change, that in itself is challenging. So, you know, for those who are listening, who are thinking to themselves, like, you know what, I, I want to be more heart centered. I, I want to be able to tap into that. But I may not be in an environment where I feel like there's safety for me to show up as my real self. I don't see it modeling, being modeled by my manager or other people that I've worked with. I just don't know how. What advice would you give to that individual, regardless of whether they're seasoned or, you know, an emerging leader who is really just a little stuck on where to begin? They have to have the openness and really the drive to have a conversation with their supervisor. And they're going to know quickly if that supervisor is going to even allow that space. If that's something that's not within your company, this is why people are leaving. This is why ghosting cropped in the world and really took precedence in the fall of 2018 before COVID. It just became more aware because we were all at home. We were a bit more relaxed. We were paying attention because we had time. So ghosting is not new, but if people aren't being treated in a kind way where they feel that they have psychological safety, there's a lot of jobs out there right now. And a lot of people are working remotely and it's kind of like the world is their oyster. Yeah. And, and you have to go with your gut and you know, to me, I think the shift happened right at the start of the Industrial Revolution. If I think back through history, we always find our answers when we look back. You know, I think back to, you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s. It was a bartering system. You know, what can I do for you? How can I help you? You know, it was reciprocal and transactional, but it was laden with heart-centeredness. Somebody's going to build the barn. Everybody comes to help build the barn. Somebody's going to bring the lunch, the bread, whatever. We lost that through capitalism and academic development and the development of playbooks and leadership. And then business acumen became so logic that there was never space or allowance for any emotional intelligence. So the leaders of today have emotional intelligence, but the ones that are winning and leading with heart, they have emotional resilience and, and they're not afraid to be authentic and transparent. And you're allowed to have personal stuff at work. I always say life shows up at work and work shows up at life. How can it not? We, we, we don't have a date or a time for emergencies. That's why they're emergencies. We, we handle what comes our way in however it comes. And there has to be some openness and leniency. And the only way that's ever integrated is with heart-centered leadership and utilizing that emotional intelligence, but it's right there along with emotional resilience and when they're together, that's when people feel psychologically safe. Right, right. You know, you mentioned ghosting and, you know, of course, last year it was quiet quitting and it was just like, people, these things are not new. <laughs> they just have a cool new name to them. But th these things were happening. And to your point, you know, it was large scale just because we had time to pay attention. But it's been happening. But I, I think the good part that has come out of this is that, you know, more and more 
leaders within organizations, more and more leaders within society, they're paying attention now. They're paying attention. And the battle of moving away from one way of being, right, in terms of logic when it comes to running a business and everything else to tapping into to who they are, that process is, it, well, it started, I, I think, before the pandemic. But I feel like it's it goes back to the pandemic and, and the challenges that it brought. It all also brought a lot of blessings. And we're, we're seeing that shift and we're seeing the change. One thing that you said was trust your gut. And it made me go back to conversations that I've had with people that I've supported, leaders that I've supported. And I've actually gotten the questions around, well, what does that mean? Like, usually when people think that they're trusting their gut, right, sometimes it's it's based out of fear. And so if you haven't had the opportunity to connect to a deeper part of yourself, right, you trusting your gut may be a result of, of fear or experiences that you've had. You know, not to get too too deep on here, but I also like to bring things into a practical space so that people really understand, especially if they have the desire and the drive to make changes. Where do I start? Because again, that's unless you're working with a coach or unless you're working with a therapist, most people don't know how to change and are resistant to change. So what are your thoughts around like what and again, there's there's no right or wrong answer here, but for someone who is really looking to tap into their inner wisdom and deeper essence of who they are, how might they start that? That's a great question. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. Before I answer that, I just want to touch on the intuition piece. So, because my background's in neuroscience. So our frontal lobe is the biggest part of our brain. It's 50%. It's right here. Our frontal lobe is actually attached to our stomach. So when people say, I got this feeling in my gut, they really do. And, and the messaging is aligned and linked with their brain, literally. In leadership, there's a facet of leadership that's called intuition management. If you look at the C-suite level, and there was a study that came out the fall of 2021, 76% of C-suite leaders use intuition management because they are inundated with the amount of information coming at them. And they land up kind of in a 2D model. They're either going to make a decision or they're going to delegate. 76% of their day, they go with their gut. So how does one tap into that inner wisdom? As a yoga teacher, I'm going to tell you it's meditation. It's getting on your yoga mat. And it's not about the mat. It's not about doing downward dogs. Yoga means science of the mind. So the goal is, why are you getting on that mat? Why are you doing that meditation? What are you going to leave on that mat? But what are you going to take away? So it's, it's a foundation of intention. And when you can get silent, and I get asked this every day, how can I get silent when my mind's racing? Take advantage of a process that you do every day and you really forget you're doing it, breathing. So when you can stop and take six deep diaphragmatic breaths, takes 90 seconds, you're going to stop that racing brain. You're going to get to a level of silence and you start with a couple of minutes. You don't sit down and, and think you're going to turn into a meditation guru overnight. I mean, I've been meditating since my 20s. More seriously, since I've been teaching and doing my own yoga practice, which is seven years, and I'm up to four and a half hours where I can meditate now. What does that do? It helps you get to a level of equanimity, which means mental calmness and composure. And this is something that I teach a lot of teams and, and leaders and executives and C-suites. When you can bring equanimity to all that you are and all that you do, your inner and outer world is completely aligned. I love that. I I look, I felt that. I, I just felt like a calm <laughs> just came over me as you were speaking. I I've read the positive intelligence book and you know some of the, the directives there. And you know, I've I've started in my own just because I, you know, sometimes you don't realize how anxious you are. I remember the first time I, I tried to like meditate, it was just like 
just racing thoughts. And I was like, yeah, this this isn't for me. But I've been intentional. I've nowhere near four hours, like four seconds or maybe four minutes at most. But nonetheless, one of the things that I, I found is touch, right? Just the physical touching of my hands and, you know, taking in like the crevices and everything else. Like it does something for me. I can feel my jaw relaxing, like everything just kind of like any stress in the moment melts away. And, you know, these are things that we can do when we're in a boardroom, when we're at a networking event, or when we're in any environment that may seem a little bit more stressful, or, you know, there's a lot of activity happening. And so I I, I love the, thank you for breaking that down and giving that specific example, because at the end of the day, what it really boils down to is intentionality, right? How do you want to be? Do you want to constantly be anxious and feeling like the world is on your shoulders? Or do you want to be able to make decisions and experience life from a place a, of calm and peace and joy? Not to say that it's going to be like that, you know, 24 hours, 365, but we do have that within our control. And, and, and I'm glad that there are individuals like you who are teaching people that no, Life does not have to suck and it does not have to be crazy every single day. There are things that are within our control and being able to tap into that. So, so thank you for sharing that. It's my pleasure. And, and, you know, when we take time for self-care and we see it modeled by a leader, that it's not selfish and it's okay to put ourselves first, that just allows our self-love, our self compassion. It gives our self-awareness wider space. And when we're in sync with that, there's no guilt, there's no shame, there's no remorse because it's been modeled within the company that it's okay. And this is where a lot of people struggle because they don't have leaders that do that because it's not in the playbook. It's not in the languaging. Yeah, agreed. And and that's a great segue into you know, the whole notion behind the series, right? Lead Her Ship Reloaded. And so, you know, as I've had conversations with women, all walks of life, corporate entrepreneurship, stay-at-home moms, and even from myself and my own experiences, right? There is this, at least growing up in corporate or starting in corporate, there was this notion of, you know, you can't be too emotional, right? Like you, you, yeah. It has to be about the business. You have to remain objective. Like, you know, you don't buy into people's stories. You don't build these relationships with people, which which is crazy because unfortunately, that's that's how we're built as women, right? We are nurturers. We are empathetic. We're compassionate. And so for a very right. long time, that playbook that you keep referencing, that playbook almost said you can't be who you are to be successful and to count as a leader. And now things have shifted where there's an invitation to say, actually, you know what? Who you are is exactly what we need. And so I feel like we're at this at this place where women in general, and I know I'm generalizing here, but women in general are starting to say, you know what? Maybe, maybe I can be me. Maybe I I I can show up and, you know, not feel like I'm going to be left behind in my career or that clients aren't going to want to work with me because I'm too soft or too nice or, you know, any of those things. So I'm curious from your perspective, and especially since you, you've been pioneering this movement, you know, well before it was an actual movement, how are you seeing women uh, adjust and take ownership and really embrace who they are and the things that make them them in this time where now the the cry, if you will, of our society is we need more of that. But we we have great conversations and we make space so that they give themselves permission and they have to go back and look at their history to where where it was learned, where it was modeled. You know, we always have to go back because there's there's lineage in our story. And, and we land where we are in the present moment when we can go back and look and see where we've come from. And when we can go back and take the lid off Pandora's box and, and heal ourselves, especially for women, there's a lot of guilt around being a working wife, working mom. We're pulled in 50 directions. 
But when they go back and look at their lineage and we basically rewire the story and because something was, doesn't mean it has to be now. So we anchor in the present moment to figure out, okay, this is where I am. How did I get here? And then they grant themselves permission and say, I don't want to be that person anymore. And then we work on strategies to work on that inner self and how we can accept it and listen to it and lead from that place with all of the soft skills. So completely from the inside out. And and it's really beautiful to watch as a coach. I'm sure. Yes, it absolutely is. I'm curious though, as we, you know, and for those who are listening who are like, I'm a busy executive or, you know, whether it's in corporate or they're running their own businesses, right, as solopreneurs, or maybe they have a small team. You know, I'm trying to build this thing. I have a family. I have these responsibilities. I have all of these roles, right? I don't have time to stop and think about, you know, lineage or I don't I don't have the emotional bandwidth Mm -hmm. to, you know, even peel back the band-aid that I had to put on, you know, two years ago in that particular place. So how can we encourage, how can we support, how can we make that process a lot less scary and maybe even just painful to the mind, the subconscious mind that is like, don't do it, don't do it, to say, you know what, this is actually what I need to let go of some of the stuff that I was carrying. You can't grow when you're comfortable. And if you don't make time, you're going to continue on with that negative and fear-based behavior. And I see women with a multitude of ideas and they're like, but Deb, I'm independent. I'm creative. I just don't want blah, blah, blah. The words sorry, just, and busy are in none of my clients' vocabularies. We pack them up. We put them out with the trash. They're not intentional. If you want to grow, it comes with discomfort because you're going to a place and honoring yourself to go there, knowing it's going to come with some bumps and humps and emotional distress, but we can't go where we want to go if we don't give ourselves permission. And the busyness is just a fear-based behavior that's in overdrive. It's a wall of resistance that, that a person has put up. and you have to look at everything and open the bandwidth so that we can go there. And there's nobody you can talk to me about that hasn't grown, that doesn't have a story with pain involved. You're right. You're absolutely right. That is that is the truth. I'm, I'm thinking about someone that I, I, I spoke with recently who, you know, is a mom of four, looking to climb the corporate ladder, also looking to build a business. And you know, I, I kept asking, like, you know, why why do you want these things, right? Like, why do you want this next thing? And it was like, oh, well, for this person, and then, and this person, I can do this, and then this person, I can do this, and this, this person, I can do this. And I, was, I, I just kept asking, okay, well, why do you want this? What will it mean to you? What is the gift in this for you? And she had, she had difficulty just even processing that. And, you know, of course, I told her, you know what, she was finally got to the point where she's like, I don't have an answer. I was like, that's okay. That in and of itself is an answer. And that's a starting point. And so for those of you who are listening, who, you know, may be in that same space, right, where like, you don't, you're doing these things because that's what is expected of you or what you think is expected of you or the obligations that, you know, other people have put on you and you don't. You haven't been able to answer that question. What do I want? It's okay. You recognizing that and getting even to that point of awareness is evidence that you are now ready to discover that answer. Absolutely. And and allow some openness to give yourself time to get there. It's going to come with apprehension. It's going to come with trepidation. But any change in life does. Absolutely. 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 Well, Deb, I, I want to be respectful of your time here. This this I could talk to you for hours, especially in this space. And, and hopefully for those of you who are listening, you know, if nothing else, right, like Deb's calm, soothing way of being in her presence. If you're just listening, if you or if you get to watch this, you'll you'll see it and you'll experience it. You know, I'm hoping that that has pattern interrupt 
for the the time being your day where you know you you've given yourself permission to just breathe or you've given yourself permission to just answer the question, what do I want today, <laughs> right? Maybe not, what do I want in life, but what do I want today? What do I want in this hour? You know, what would give me joy? What would give me satisfaction? And how can I tap into the authentic me in this moment? So with that, I want to transition into our little blitz section here. Are you game? I'm game. Let's okay. do it. Awesome. All right. So as you think about everything you've experienced and, you know, you thank you so much for your vulnerability and, and sharing your your experience in adolescence, right, and in, in to coming into who you are today. But as you look back overall, right, in, in your time here on earth, and you think back to a younger version of yourself, maybe it was that 21-year-old self or maybe a younger one. And based on what you've learned today, you want to go back and you want to give her a piece of advice to that will either, you know, help her move forward or help her have some peace in the moment of what she's dealing with, what would you go back and share with your younger self? I would tell her that her voice matters. I would tell her not to be afraid to share her thoughts and to just, you know, to go for it and not be afraid. I love that. The voice matters. I feel like that that's a, that's a common theme, especially within this last year of women exercising their voices without shame, without guilt, without, you know, worry of how they will be perceived. Mm-hmm. And the more and more you've seen that demonstrated, the more, again, going back to that Miriam Williamson thing, the more it's given others permission to say, you know what, I have something to say too. So I, I love that that's the advice that she would give your younger self. So if we fast forward, right, and you are looking at your life you know, all that you've accomplished, all the many leaders that you've touched, that you've you've shared your light with. And, you know, you're thinking about your legacy and you're thinking about this is what I'm going to leave behind in the earth. What what will that be? What might that look like? What thoughts do you want to have around that? Well, I have two daughters and a new granddaughter. And the work that I'm doing now is my legacy work. And it, it excites me that I'm going to leave them when I, when I leave this earth better than what it was when I was here. Okay. Lots more heart-centered leaders. Yes, we need that. We need that. The, <laughs> the, the earth is crying out for that. And we see that every single day. And then the last question that I have for you in the book section is around reading. So I see the bookshelf in the background. And I am a believer that leaders are readers, or at least leaders should should have the mindset of constant growth. So I'm curious, are there any books or is there one book that has been pivotal for you in your growth, in your development, and, you know, just supporting you along the way? I have, I think I have about six, <laughs> I have about six on the go right now. The one that I received for Christmas was The Light We Carry by Michelle Obama. Really, really love that because I I read it and I can hear her voice and her speaking. And I just love how she shared how she felt through the pandemic and, and how she mothered and how she was a wife and tried to keep up her commitments. Professionally, last year, one of the best books that I ever read was Boundary Boss by Terry Cole. Cannot recommend that book enough. I've bought about 15 of them. I've given them out to clients because we get, you know, we get a little bit of success and we get to a level and we either overdo it or we become complacent. And this book really anchors you and she uses the metaphor of a basement to clean out our subconscious. That's your basement but there's great exercises and she's a psychotherapist, I believe out of Colorado. It's one of the best books I've ever written. And it helped me kind of renew and revisit my boundaries because when you're a heart-centered leader, you still can say no. Probably like the, the biggest challenge and hurdle, right? Because you want to lead with empathy. Like that is the, that is the natural pull, but learning how to set boundaries and uphold them yourself and others. <laughs> I think yes. I think when we talk about boundaries, it's usually in the concept of, 
you know, how do you, you know, maintain boundaries with others? But I found, and I don't know about you, but maintaining boundaries with myself has been by far much more hard than it has been, you know, with trying to do with other people. It is. And there's one more book. I hope I'm saying his name correctly. It's called Indistractable yes. by by Near Al. That book was solid. Like I I devoured that book. It was it was so well written. And I think it helped me revisit how I spend my time, reassure that I've got white space, everything we've talked about today. I mean, time is our richest commodity and it's non-refundable. So we have to spend it wisely. And that book just had me revisit all of my own processes and my own self-care. And that's a powerful one as well. We will add all three to the show notes. So be sure to check those out. And in addition to that, Deb, if, you know, individuals want to connect with you, they want to learn more about your practice or your yoga and, and what you do, they'd, of course, have to go out to Canada to, to <laughs> participate in that. But uh, share with us, you know, where do you hang out? How can they get in touch with you? So everything is on my website, debcrow.com. And Crow has an E on the end. It just means I'm Irish. And it's interesting that you mentioned the yoga because I never... I never saw the three worlds kind of integrating and it's, it's given a whole new vision for corporate wellness in helping your staff stay strong, healthy, and vital and not visiting corporate wellness when they're stressed and sick and off on a short-term disability claim, which was my old world. So it's been a very serendipitous integrated January and, and here we are in February. I can't believe it. <laughs> like January came and went. I was just like, I'm here and I'm going. And then also, I know that obviously you have a podcast as well that has been in production for almost three years now around heart-centered leadership. So I invite you to share about the podcast so that, you know, the listeners, if they want to hear more of your soothing, inspiring voice, where they can, where they can access that. So we have a tab on our website. I decided to call the podcast Imperfect, the Heart-Centered Leadership Podcast. And I talk with leaders from all over the globe in different sectors. And we highlight what heart-centered leadership looks like, but how imperfect it is to get there and be there and, and really laugh at our imperfections. I love it. Love it. And then do you want to talk about the book or Eric? I'm writing my first book. I have co-authored four books. I'm writing my first book on heart-centered leadership. And the hope is that it'll be published by the end of the year. It's scary and fun all at the same time. I'm sure. I'm sure. Awesome. Well, everything, like Deb said, is on her website. So we'll definitely include her website as well as her social handles. I know you're, you're big on LinkedIn and I believe Instagram as well. So we'll be sure to include those. I, again, Deb, I can't thank you enough for joining us on the show and for, you know, just sharing, just sharing you, the essence of who you are and, and giving us some practical tips on how to tap back into the essence of who we are as we lead in our organizations, as we lead in our businesses, as we lead in our homes and our communities. So with that, thank you again. And thank you to you or to those of you who are listening. We will be back next week with another amazing woman leader for the Leadership Reloaded series. Thank you and take care. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of She Leads Now. If you found today's episode helpful or got a piece of insight that you plan to implement in your business or organization, I would love to hear from you. Connect with me on LinkedIn at Sabine Gideon, that's my handle, and send me a private message or feel free to go ahead and leave a review on either Apple or Spotify. I also invite you to share this episode with anyone in your network who you think might benefit from this content. Lastly, be sure to check the show notes and the description below for links to resources, including relevant downloads, articles, and any upcoming training. Until we chat again, have a blessed and powerful week.